Good morning and welcome to another video tutorial designed for students studying English Literature at A-Level and reading Othello uh, by William Shakespeare. In today's video tutorial, part one of a series of lessons on Act 1, Scene 3, we are looking at the confrontation between Othello, Brabantio and the assembly of Venetian leaders that takes place uh, in which Brabantio declares that he had he's he's suffering from a grievance which is that Othello has stolen his daughter as he puts it and Othello afterwards is positioned to address the company and to explain how he came to win Desdemona uh, not through the black magic as suggested by Brabantio, but actually through the power of language, the power of storytelling, uh, and his deeds in battle. So we're going to look at that. Uh, sp we're going to look at that confrontation. We're, we're not going to be looking at the longer speech, which starts with Othello declaring, "Her father loved me." That that's going to be the next lesson. But we are going to be looking at the confrontation between the two men. We're going to be looking at the two differing accounts of Othello and Brabantio. So before we start today's close reading, uh, it's worth saying fairly obviously if you haven't watched the previous episodes, I would suggest going back and watching those first. Let's go through our close reading of this scene then. So I'm going to start uh, with Brabantio entering uh, the assembly and interrupting the assembly. Remember, the, the assembly is actually a military one. It's, it's the senators of Venice discussing how to respond to the threat of the Ottoman Empire encroaching upon their stronghold uh, of Cyprus. So it's, there's an international threat going on here. There's a potential conflict taking place. And so enraged and so embittered is uh, Brabantio, that he actually chooses to interrupt this incredibly important assembly with his own domestic grievances. So we have this kind of uh, juxtaposition of um, international conflict and external conflict with issues that are frankly domestic. Um, so it's a, it's a jarring moment and in fact I would argue that Brabantio looks rather foolish or could could be perceived to be rather foolish to interrupt such an assembly with his own personal grievances and there's a comedic edge to this because of the dramatic irony uh, we know as an audience that Brabantio uh, is here to complain about his daughter being supposedly stolen by a fellow he'll use the same racially charged language as Iago and Rodrigo but we know as an audience from previous scenes that Desdemona is not actually, you know, she's not in any danger, she's not dead. Whereas the overwhelming emotion displayed by Brabantio here actually is quite comedic because the reaction of the Duke and the senators is, is she dead? Uh, he's so hyperbolic and so exaggerated, you know, he's, full of, he's so kind of full of exaggerations of Brabantio that actually he comes across as being over the top. So he says, my particular grief is so floodgate uh, and overbearing nature that it engluts and swallows other causes uh, and other sorrows, and it is still itself. So he creates this idea, the sense that his personal issue is the floodgate. It's a hugely important one. I think we still use that, fr it, that phrase in modern day parlance, the opening the floodgates. Um, it supposedly devours and swallows other sorrows. So he's actually implying that his domestic issue is actually more important than the external conflict taking place in the play that has kind of hovered and hung over the play so far, which is of course the threat of, of the Ottoman Empire encroaching upon Venetian territory. So when he says, so he, he I, I would argue he looks rather foolish. Um, and of course, that's that's to the audience, maybe not to the senators, but to the audience because of the use of dramatic irony, because we know his uh, concerns are actually rather trivial in comparison to the huge issues uh, of uh, geopolitics that are taking place. I'll put geopolitics here as well. So, um, and obviously the word grief uh, implies that he has lost someone. It, it implies uh, a sense of being bereaved and yet of course we know that Desdemona is alive and well and married to a fellow. The Duke says why what's the matter and it's because of his hyperbolic overreaction perhaps. Brabantio's language again 
my daughter, oh, my daughter. And again, it comes, it's rather comedic for us as an audience because of the dramatic irony, because we know that he is not actually grieving his daughter. He's, made, he's, he's grieving the fact that she has disobeyed him and that she's fallen into the clutches of the moors, he puts it. So my daughter, my daughter, again, this, this, there's been obviously this, the um, assonance of the O, oh, that extended sound, that utterance implies a grief, implies that he's mourning her death, and it makes him seem ridiculous to the audience. And I think that's important. Um, Brabantio is being ridiculed, I would argue, by Shakespeare because he, has, because he is over the top, because he has gullibly swallowed the pack of lies that he's been told by Iago and Rodrigo, and he's, he believes it's wholesale. And we've, we as an audience have been introduced to Othello. We know that the portrait, uh, or the caricature rather, created by Iago and Rodrigo of Othello being this lascivious, sexually aggressive, lustful, uh, irrational lunatic, essentially, is completely in in inaccurate. Think about the uh, comparisons of Othello to the Barbary horse and the uh, black ram earlier in the play and of course now we know having seen Othello that he's virtuous he's noble he's to be trusted um, and, and he's not he's, he's the opposite rather of these stereotypes so again I, I would argue that he is being ridiculed here because he's he's see, he's just acting in a ridiculous fashion and of course we, I, I think the audience would, would, would get a laugh here when the senators ask is she dead because it's such a ridiculous response and Brabantio then replies and this is actually quite important he says I to me and this, uh, this emphasises the importance of patriarchy and the pa patriarchal structure of Venetian society. And it reminds us as an audience, I suppose, of the transgression that Desdemona has committed. She has broken an important social norm. She has gone against her father's wishes. She's not uh, married the man of his choice, which is, which is a transgression um, which Othello will explain later on, but it is one that might shock an audience, uh, especially uh, one uh, watching it during the Elizabethan period. Um, and she's dead to him because of that breach of trust. Remember that patriarchy was seen as being the god of the household. Uh, I'll, put, I'll put that here. God of household. Um, and by going against the wishes of that god, I suppose, we could argue that Desdemona has acted in a blasphemous or heretical way, um, and that's why he's taking this to heart. She's dead to him. It's quite a significant moment. And then we have basically echoes. Uh, we've already heard these arguments, so I won't spend too much time on this. But Brabantio says she's abused, stolen uh, from me, corrupted by spells and medicines. We've heard this accusation of black magic and of conjuring potions in the previous episode. Obviously nonsensical, obviously uh, based on racial stereotypes. Um, because Othello is exoticized because of his colour and because of his because of his background as a Moor, uh, these kind of racial stereotypes of black magicians, black magic, um, shamanistic rituals are used by Brabantio against Othello, but of course are rather ridiculous given he is a well-known and, and highly regarded general. But he again he uses this idea of uh, this idea. It, it must basically what what Brabantio is saying is it must be black magic because it's so unnatural. That's the point that we will hear over and over again from Brabantio that the union, uh, the miscegenation between Desdemona and Othello is unnatural and monstrous, and it goes against all societal norms. That's why going back to the fact that she's dead to him, that's why he's taken her so personally, because she's breached what he considers to be a, a sacred uh, norm of society. So she must have fallen in, she must have, she must have fallen into this trap, or she must have been charmed in order to fall in love with a black man, is what he's basically arguing here. Um, and then essentially he, he emphasises that later on, uh, he says, for nature so preposterously to err. So he, he's saying, uh, to err is to wander on, onto the wrong path or to make a mistake. And what he means here is that Desdemona is erring in wandering away with Othello. So she's making a mistake and nature is making a mistake. It, so it's, it's a personification of nature, but it's also this argument that we've, we've heard before that 
he is committing an act, uh, sorry, she, Desdemona, is committing an act that is wholly monstrous and unnatural. Even the word er uh, is, I think, playing on the exotic nature of Othello, the fact that he is a wanderer. He's seen as a stranger, we think about earlier in the play. And actually the word er, uh, in this sense, is used, in my, in my opinion, to present him as being extravagant and exotic again. And it's preposterous to him, it's monstrous. That's what he means here. It's the, the, the adverb preposterous is quite, is quite important here. What he means is that it's completely monstrous of her to have done this. Um, and he's kind of setting him up, himself up here for a big fall, isn't he? Because he's made these huge claims, these huge charges. And of course, if Desdemona can prove that the, these are all nonsense, and if Othello can prove that these are nonsense claims, he's going to look incredibly foolish, which is what happens, ultimately. And then he makes this, again, incredibly insulting he, he emphasises in, this insulting point, being not deficient, blind, or lame of sense. So he's saying, my daughter has none of these deficits. She's not deficient. She, she hasn't got any kind of disfigurement. She's not uh, mentally deficient. She's not retarded, is what he's saying here. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. That's what he, they would have said about her. He's, she's not that. She's intelligent. She's not blind. How insulting is this uh, notion? So she can see. And again, he's painting a fellow as being a monster and as being something repugnant and repulsive because of his skin colour, because of his complexion. Um, if she could see as the implication, she would never choose to marry this man. Uh, she's not lame of sense, so she has her senses. She's not, uh, again, she's not an idiot. She's not someone who uh, cannot make decisions. So therefore, she must have been charmed. And he comes back to this point at the end of the passage. It must have been witchcraft. Sans witchcraft could not. Sans means without in French. So it must have been Othello's witchcraft that had won her over. And if these charges weren't shocking and incendiary, incendiary enough, he also repeats the argument he made earlier about her being abused. And he talks about that association of corruption and also the implication of rape and of, being, and, and of uh, force, uh, Othello forcing himself upon Desdemona. Initially, I'm not going to actually go into this, this part here from the Duke. Initially, the Duke is supportive. Initially, the Duke uh, says, well, the Book of Law will be on your side and will bring to bear the justice that's required for the person who perpetrated this crime. So initially, the Duke is on Branchio's side uh, until he hears more of the story. So, here we are. Brabantio then is asked, well, who is this person? And he says, humbly, I thank your grace. Here is the man, this more. Um, and again, once again, he is entirely basing Othello's identity on his race and on his complexion. So again, race and identity are becoming, you know, are obviously, it goes without saying, are hugely important themes. But again, Othello is consistently defined by his race, by those who set out to destroy him. It's... Um, there's quite a few critics who read Iago as being essentially the mouthpiece of racist Venetian society. He's the one who actually uh, says the unsayable, says the race, racist beliefs that Venetian society held. And I think Brabantio is repeating these ideas, repeating these uh, racist slurs. And it is, I think, you know, a definite insult to, to label him as just being the more. Remember, Othello is much more than that. He is a leader, he is a soldier, he is a husband, uh, he is a citizen. And all of that has been stripped away from him, and he's been rendered into just more. And I think, I think it's insulting, it, 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 it debases Othello's accomplishments. And all are sorry to hear it when they hear, that when they hear uh, of his woes. But I think it is important, and again, because of the dramatic, I'll put DI for dramatic irony, because we know that he's interrupting a very important assembly that is about geopolitical issues, I think the fact that he says your special mandate for the state affairs uh, has been brought before, he reminds, himself, he reminds us here that he's, he's actually interrupting a really important assembly that will decide Venice's future and actually lead to conflict between the Ottomans uh, uh, at Cyprus. The Duke asks, well, what in your part can you say to this, to Othello? And Brabantio says nothing, but this is so. So he's speaking, what I think is interesting here is that actually Brabantio decides to speak on uh, Othello's behalf, and he seems to negate and forget about one of the most important principles of Western civilization, which is that, you know, when you're, when you're uh, charged with a crime, you are innocent uh, until 
uh, I'll say he's negating presumed innocence, isn't he? Um, he's in, Othello, in Brabantio's eyes, Othello is wholly guilty, and he's not going to allow Othello to even speak for himself. And I think this is again, if we're looking at this from a kind of racial lens, the fact that the white citizen speaks for the black Moor to, 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 and, and, and doesn't allow him to speak for himself. Again, we see these racial kind of hierarchies playing throughout the play. So, Othello is then put on the spot. And we've seen Othello uh, under great pressure earlier when confronting that angry mob. So we're not now particularly surprised to hear another very toned, uh, toned? Very measured, rather, uh, wise and... Um, respectful and dignified speech. You can write those notes in your uh, beside you, so I'll put dignified, measured. Uh, there's a juxtaposition between the incendiary, uh, violent language of Brabantio, the hostile language, the poisonous language of Brabantio that is designed to stoke tension, designed to incite, and the very measured, neutral, respectful language of Othello is deliberately juxtaposed. I think, again, because Brabantio, for me, in terms of thinking about the writer's a purpose, Brabantio is the subject of ridicule. Shakespeare is ridiculing Brabantio and ridiculing the ideas that he holds, in my opinion. So let's read, I mean, I've basically coloured in the speech. I was going to try and find the most important moments, but it's really quite important in general. Othello says, most potent, grave and reverend signors. Uh, I'll, I'll read it through first, by the way, I'll come back. Most potent, grave and reverend signors, my very noble and approved good masters, that I have taken away this old man's daughter is most true. True way I have married her, the very head and front of my offending, hath this extent no more. Rude am I in speech, and little blessed with the soft phrase of peace. For since these arms of mine have seven years pith, till now some nine moons wasted, they have used their dearest action in the tented field. And little of this great world can I speak more than pertains to feats of broil and battle. And therefore little shall I grace my cause in speaking for myself. Yet, by your gracious patience, I will a round, unvarnished tale deliver of my whole course of love. What drugs, what charms, what conjuration, and what mighty magic for such proceeding I am charged with all. I won his daughter. What a wonderful rebuke. I think uh, the fact that he delivers such a measure, such a di dignified, such a controlled speech when sh confronted with these very damaging charges. Think about the implications for Othello. If he were to be charged with any of these uh, charges brought upon him by Brabantia, he would be ruined. His reputation would be destroyed. There's a lot at stake for Othello here, and yet he shows this wonderful uh, dignity and, and measuredness in his response. Initially, he's very respectful. Uh, he recognises the power, the, the wisdom, the rev, you know, the, the um, authority of the signor. So he's uh, essentially showing respect, showing um, showing humility towards the assembly of Venetians. This, that's, what, that's who the signors are. My very noble and approved good masters. And again, he recognises his status. He recognises that he is a servant of Venice. And I think the fact that he... Uh, recognises his position in society initially uh, is possibly ingratiating but I think actually a wise move to remind his audience that he is a loyal servant of Venice and he, 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 he will use that as his argument uh, for his rudeness of speech later on in the speech. He addresses the issue uh, uh, head on. He, he, takes it, he confronts it initially straight away. I have taken away this old man's daughter and I think it's important that he he addresses this, and he's quite candid about. Uh, I don't know why I put W there. He's quite candid about the fact that he's essentially stolen her. I think the fact that he uses that phrase, he doesn't use it. It's it's slightly more measured than uh, the accusations of robbery that were thrown at him earlier on. But the fact that he's said, "I've taken her away," he actually does acknowledge. He acknowledges that he has made a blunder in the sense that he has gone against social norms. He has subverted social expectations in the fact that the tradition would be that the husband-to-be, the fiancé, would ask the, the father of the bride's permission to marry. And he, he, he acknowledges that he's, he's, he's made an error here. Um, 
possibly he's insulting Brabantio by rendering him to an old man. Possibly this is, an, this is a, if you go back to the, the moor, possibly this is a kind of verbal revenge for the insult of being defined by his race. Well, he's defining Brabantio by his age. He's an old man. But he does acknowledge the crime, I suppose, or he acknowledges the breach of convention, at least. Which is, again, a wise move, because he's going to explain how he did it, uh, and how he managed to win Desdemona. He reiterates, it is most true. And he reiterates this word, he repeats the word true a number of times, uh, which might be a kind of gamble in terms of his rhetoric. But I, th I think, actually, it's a rhetorical uh, device. Uh, and I think it's actually used here to persuade the audience later on because he'll use it as a stepping stone towards his logical, as part of his logical argument for why he uh, married Othello, uh, why he married Desdemona. I have married her, the very head and front of my offending hath this extent no more. And here's where he, the, I suppose it's a shift in his argument because he's acknowledged uh, that what he means is that this is the entire issue, this is the only issue. Only issue. This is the only issue that he, he, he ought to be facing, the only charge he ought to face is that he has, and he admits to, having um, taken Brabantio's daughter. Okay. So I'm going to sort my camera out. Okay, so um, he says that's the only issue, the head and front of my offending. So it's the only crime, I suppose, he's willing to, to admit to. The only, the only guilt he's willing to uh, admit to is the, the guilt of having gone uh, and married Desdemona without the permission of her father. We then have this self-deprecating um, description of himself. He says, rude am I in speech and little blessed with the soft phrase of peace. And he's very clever here because firstly he's, he's kind of implicitly apologising for his clumsiness in his rhetoric. And, I mean, clearly he's not, I mean, when he says rude in mind speech he means that he's, he's rough, he's, that he, that he, he's uh, unrefined, he has, he's coarse, I suppose. But actually he's not. We can see from this speech he's actually rather eloquent, he's, um, he, he's actually able to skillfully uh, constructs a verbal argument and he's able to use his powers of rhetoric to persuade his audience. So actually he's being self-deprecating here. Uh, he says, little blessed with the soft phrases of peace. And what he does here in that metaphor of the soft phrase of peace is he reminds, again, just as he did earlier on, he reminds the audience of his status as a servant of Venice. Now, again, he reminds them of his status uh, as a soldier and as a general. And it's a clever thing, I think it's a clever move by Othello to have just used his status, used his position in society, reminded his audience of uh, the loyalty he's shown and exhibited throughout his career before going into the issue at hand. I think it was a clever uh, move from Othello. And he reminds them in quite a lot of detail, he says, since these arms of mine had seven years pith, so since I was seven years old, uh, till now some nine moons wasted. Uh, so since, recent, since basically recently is what he means here. Uh, they have used, he's talking about they being his arms, by the way. They have used their dearest action in the tented field. And the tented fields, uh, again, is a, a kind of metaphor for the battlefield. So he's saying, you know, these arms of mine, since I was a very young man, have been used only to fight. I'm a fighter, I'm a, I'm a warrior, I'm a soldier. Uh, I'm not used to having... You, to using these arms to gesticulate, to, to, to speak publicly, uh, to make my point. Um, and he's apologising, he's being rather self-deprecating about his powers of speech, um, and he's about to deliver, in the next lesson we're going to look at, he's going to deliver this wonderful speech in his defence. He says, Little of this great world can I speak, more than pertains to the feats of royal and battle. Okay, so... He's, although he has, and we'll talk about this in, in the next lesson, although he has seen a lot of the world, although he is very much well-travelled, um, he doesn't know, he, what he's saying is here, he's rather, he's rather naive, uh, and he actually professes to being ignorant. He doesn't know a lot about the world other than feats of broil and battle, other than warfare. 
So his entire, what's interesting here, and if I, if I make the point without going back to it, think about how Brabantio labelled him and, and constructed his identity based solely on him being a Moor. So if you think about how complex identity is, what, what a fellow is doing is he's rebuking this idea that he's simply you know, only a Moor and he's creating this identity for himself. He's actually constructing a more, uh, I suppose, a, a, he's constructing an identity that is more complex but also one that takes into consideration all that he's done for the state, which is a very clever argument. So he's saying, I'm not just a Moor, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this, and, and he's clearly reminding them again and again and again of his importance to them in warfare. Is that a coincidence with the Turks arriving in Cyprus? I think not. So he's actually reminding them, well, you're, before you throw me into prison, you're going to need me uh, to lead your, to lead, um, to lead these uh, ships to Cyprus and to lead them to battle. He says, little shall I grace my cause in speaking for myself. So once again, we have another example of Othello being self-deprecating because, of course, actually what he's about to do is use his uh, power of speech to do exactly that. He's about to grace his cause, isn't he? Yet by your gracious patience, I will a round, unvarnished tale deliver of my whole course of love. So he sets up his stall, as it were. He's a, he's a, he gives them the roadmap uh, to his speech. He says, well, here is what I'm going to talk about. I will give a round, unvarnished tale. And I think it's important that he says these two adjectives, round being complex and full story. He's going to give his full version of events. Unvarnished, meaning that it's going to be coarse and rough and rude and not, you know, not neat and tidy because he's, again, reminding us again that he's not an orator. He's a soldier, not an orator. He's not someone used to speaking in public. He's not a professional politician like the senators are. He is someone who, is, who, who, who lets his sword do the speaking, I suppose. And he's going to tell, he's go, and, and he's going to tell her, uh, tell them rather, about the whole course of love. But it's important that he uses that word there, love, because he's going to, he's rebuking and challenging these claims and these assertions that have been cast upon him by Brabantio. So it's important that he addresses at the root of his reason to marry Desdemona. It was not a case of sexual lust. It was not a case of, you know, passions. It is the, the most universal human uh, emotion. It is love. He claims to love Desdemona and love is the reason and love is the crux as to why he married her. And Obviously, it goes without saying that he's going to argue that their love is mutual. It's not a case of him loving or lusting after her. It is a case of them falling in love, which is, of course, the most universal of human experiences and will, of course, win the support of the senators in the audience. Of course it will. And then he starts, because I think he's growing in confidence, his speech is, he, he's growing in confidence, he's so assured, he's so self-controlled. I think he now takes the opportunity to kind of mock and ridicule Brabantia. He does it quite subtly, but he says, I, I, the course of love, and he, he says, what drugs, charms, conjurations, mighty magic, uh, for, for such a proceeding I'm charged with all. So he's saying, you know, I'll, I'll explain how we fell in love and what charms and drugs and conjurations and mighty magic are used. And he's really mocking. He's taking this racial stereotype that was used by Brabantio against him and he's throwing it back in Brabantio's face and making it sound ridiculous, making Brabantio look ridiculous. And it's important to remind ourselves of how many times Brabantio tried to use this argument of Othello being a black magician against him. And here is Othello throwing that back in his face. And he ends by saying, I won his daughter. Which today sounds kind of misogynistic and um, rather hyper-masculine. But I think it's important to say that in Shakespeare's time, this would be a, a, a way of saying that he won her heart, he won her over, he he seduced her, he wooed her. I think it's actually more, in my view, to do with the kind of courtly lover role uh, that we see in lots of Shakespeare's plays. So what a juxtaposition between that uh, rhetoric of, of Brabantio and the rhetoric of Othello. And we have another juxtaposition because Brabantio speaks now. And he says, uh, he goes back to the idea of Desdemona's whiteness, which I think is really problematic. 
uh, and again, the whiteness and white and black imagery and dark and light imagery recur throughout the play and become really important and are really important throughout, but become even more important. And he goes back to his daughter, and I think he's trying to gain sympathy from the audience. He's trying to provoke their disgust. He's trying to make them place them in his shoes. So he's trying to create empathy. He says, a maiden never so bold of spirit, of so still and quiet that her motion bluster herself. So she, he paints his portrait of his daughter as being a fair, chaste, virtuous, innocent girl. She, and I think it's important that he describes her as a maiden. I think, again, he's using this idea of Othello's blackness and, and the idea of the stereotype of the sexually lascivious African against Othello. He's trying to use that as a way of provoking his audience. So he describes her as a maiden, a virgin, which I think is, again, used deliberately to provoke and to disgust the audience. And he presents her as this, you know, perfect, I idealised image of the innocent maiden. She blushes if she feels emotion. She's very still of spirits. Uh, she's she's um, the kind of idealised woman, the idealised virginal figure. And then he re reiterates his point, which he's made numerous times now. In spite of nature, he says, uh, of years of country credits. So of, in spite of her years, in spite of where she's from, she's remember she's a Venetian sister, in spite of her credits, in, in spite of her uh, reputation. So he, now he lines up the reasons as to why what Desdemona has done in marrying Othello is monstrous. And I, I've used this word in our annotations a lot, but that's what he's trying to argue. He says it's in spite of nature. So it, again, he's emphasizing the point that it's unnatural and monstrous. In spite of her years, as in she, uh, it, 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 as in this reminds us, we haven't really talked about it before, but Othello is actually a lot older than Othello. There's a large age gap. So he, remi he reminds them of the horror of the idea that his young daughter is marrying this supposedly elderly man. Of country, he means where she's from, of course, the fact that she is a European and he is a Moor. So again, the, the racial element comes in here. And lastly, of credit, of her reputation. So all of these things are supposedly, in, according to Branchio, reasons for their union to be completely unacceptable, completely unnatural. To fall in love, he emphasises, and this, this, I, it's a horrible line, it's a wonderful line, but it's also a horrible line, I think. To fall in love with that, she, what she feared to look on. A brilliant, brilliant image for, the, for, I suppose, the confrontation between East and West that takes place in their union, I suppose. The confrontation between white and black, the confrontation between the civilised and the uncivilised. He's playing on centuries of racism here centuries of racist stereotypes and racist uh, myth and legend. She should be fearful to look on Othello because of the fact that he's alien, because of the fact that he's a stranger to the land, because of the fact that he's black, and yet she's fallen in love with it. And that's the iron ironic thing here, that he uses this juxtaposition, love and fear, two opposite extreme emotions. Um, she should be fearful of this thing, which in, in Brabantio's eyes is subhuman um, and other, and yet she's fallen in love with it. That's, that's why, so what he's actually doing here is not only claiming that Othello is unnatural and monstrous, but actually that Desdemona has acted in an, un, in an unnatural and monstrous way, uh, and therefore it only could be explained by the use of medicine. It must be the fact that he drugs her that explains why she's done this. She, he can, it's, it's a very inflammatory statement. It's a judgment maimed and most imperfect. And again, once again, we have these images all to do in the same, in the same lexical field with being unnatural and being monstrous. Think about the word maimed, meaning to have a kind of disability, uh, to have um, a, a, a disfigurement. Think about the word imperfect, again, in, uh, implying a disfigurement, implying something unnatural. That will profess perfection so, co uh, so, so could earn. Again, he uses this juxtaposition in a sense Desdemona is the embodiment of perfection she is the idealized western virginal maiden Othello is the embodiment of erring he's the embodiment of this idea of being extravagant being a wanderer being alien so once again we have this confrontation of east and west this um, argument built on centuries of racist ideology
And once again, he reiterates his point against all rules of nature. So once, I mean, how many times has Brabantio made the same point here? Uh, he comes back to his thesis. It's unnatural. It's monstrous. Um, it must be the practices of cunning hell. We've seen this in a previous lesson that, you know, we saw Othello being compared to a black ram. And we talked about how he's compared to the devil uh, because of his colour, because of where he's from, because of his blackness. And again, we have this image of the black magician um, being used uh, as a derogatory uh, attempt at dis you know, provoking disgust. And he comes back to an argument, I'm not going to go over it again because it's tiresome, isn't it, really, hearing from Pabancia. Uh, he says it must be mixtures, powerful, it must be some dram. It, a dram is uh, a small medic medicinal draught. So again, we hear this argument again and again. He must have, he must have bewitched her, he must have um, put her into a trance for, him to have fallen, for her to have fallen in love with him. Okay, and then we come towards the end of the, of the scene that I want to focus on today. Um, the Duke loses faith in Brabantio's arguments. He calls them, you know, this is poor likelihoods. He basically says it's very far-fetched. These are thin habits. Um, so he, he, he's heard these two completely uh, contrasting speeches, the wonderful speech of Othello and the rather uh, Trumpian speech of Brabantio, this, you know, this inflammatory, nonsensical, ridiculous argument that Brabantio has made. And he says, I just don't believe this anymore. I think it's far-fetched. The senators then urge Othello to speak um, and question whether or not he did actually poison this young maid's affections. Uh, so they're kind of not quite as convinced as uh, the Duke. Othello then, doubling down on his argument, is so confident that he's, he's right, so confident that he's on the right side here, that he demands uh, that they send for the lady. They actually allow Desdemona to speak for herself, so she's she's allowed to be brought before her father uh, to give her own testimony. And essentially, he he's using her as a character witness, like in, in, like you do in a trial. Uh, Desdemona is going to stand uh, at the uh, is is going to stand up for Othello in front of this essentially this jury and deliver uh, her testimony from the witness box. Um, and the Duke constructs. You know, fetch Desdemona hither, bring her here. Uh, Iago goes out to get him, uh, to get them rather, and then a fellow confidently says that sh she'll come and she'll con he'll confess the vices of his blood, um, and sh he'll say uh, that she'll justly to your grave ears I'll present how I did thrive in this fair lady's love and she in mine. And he again reiterates this idea that completely, com com completely opposed to the charges made against him. The ideas of abduction, of corruption, of you know forcing himself upon Desdemona or charming her, completely contrary to Brabantio's claims. In actuality, they've fallen in love. And in the next lesson, we're going to look at the sensational speech that Othello gives. Uh, that essentially is a, is a, a, a an account of how they fell in love, and it's absolutely stunning. And we'll look at that next lesson. I hope you found that useful. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time for part two of our series of lessons on Othello Act 1, Scene 3.